Good afternoon. Welcome to Spy Chat. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have two great speakers, my fabulous boss, Chris Costa, the Executive Director of the museum, will be leading the conversation, and he's joined by Ali Soufan, a member of the Homeland Security Advisory Council. As an FBI supervisory special agent, Sufan investigated and supervised complex international terrorism cases, including the East Africa embassy bombings, the attack on the USS Cole, and the events surrounding 9-11. He is the author of Anatomy of Terror, From the Death of Bin Laden to the Rise of the Islamic States, and the New York Times bestseller, The Black Banners, the inside story of 9-11 and the war against Al-Qaeda. Um, that's the winner of the 2012 Ridenhauer Book Prize and a newly declassified edition of Black Banners, which just published in September. Chris and Ali are each going to present about topics that are catching their attention right now. And then Chris has some questions for Ali about his career and his books. And then we're gonna turn this over to your questions. Now, I cannot hand this over to Chris as much as I want to without thanking our incredible sponsors today. We have two generous sponsors, AT&T and Kerasoft. We could not do programs like this. We could not offer free programs with the caliber of speakers and the content without sponsors' generous donations to the Spy Museum. So. I really, really appreciate that. And I will now disappear and hand this over to Chris. Amanda, thank you very much. Great introduction. So uh, I want to also thank our sponsors, Kerasoff and at and We are super grateful, as Amanda said. We're going to try something a little bit different. This is a two-part introduction, if you will. We're going to talk about current events, and also I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Ali's important book, Black Banners Declassified, and then Ali will have a chance to uh, offer his thoughts, and then we'll, as Amanda said, we'll go into questions and answers. So I want to kick off with a seemingly random story that I think is very interesting and it's very important, and it harkens back to the Cold War. The story was first published in New York Times about diplomats and spies battling over suspected attacks. What suspected attacks? Evidently, there have been some microwave strikes. You might have read about it. It's been reported since 2016, 2017. These were attacks, evidently, that were directed at our diplomats on the ground in Havana and have since uh, occurred also in China as well as Russia. It is suspected, and there's been a lot of speculation, that this has been perpetrated by Russia. We're not sure who it is. When I say we, from an outsider's standpoint, I have no idea who's involved with these attacks. There aren't any medical reports that have been published. It continues to play out because some of the victims of these attacks who suffer uh, brain injuries, traumatic brain injuries, or certainly symptoms that seem like brain injuries uh, are suggesting the United States is really concealing the true extent of the injuries. There's some 50 diplomats and potentially CIA officers that have been victims of these attacks. It's a fascinating story in, in particular because it seems to be a throwback to the Cold War. And incidentally, these kinds of attacks microwaves in particular were used and employed during the Cold War, but probably not to the extent that they have been employed recently. So that said, it's an important story we should pay attention to. Second story I'm watching, and we've talked about polarization in the United States. We've talked extensively about disinformation of our electoral process. So the Washington Post, Ellen Nakashima in, in particular, wrote an article and talked about NSA and Cyber Command going on the offensive against Iran was highlighted in an article in the Post. We shouldn't be surprised that the United States has been very aggressive. That reporting took place during the week of the election. We shouldn't be surprised also that Cyber Command is likely uh, also putting pressure offensively on other countries that are interfering with our election process to include post-election, this current 
environment that we're in. So I wanna to transition to terrorism because that's part of the theme that we're gonna talk about. That's part of, of Ali Safan's long expertise, but we should pay attention to what took place recently in France. There have been three attacks, an attack at a Charlie, near the Charlie Hebdo office, of course, the newspaper that published offensive cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. There was an attack by a Pakistani immigrant against uh, some French citizens in, in France. Also, north of Paris, there was a dramatic beheading of a teacher that was trying to teach tolerance in a class, and he revealed the cartoons. He was some, subsequently attacked by a Chechen immigrant. And third, there was a third attack in Nice again. You recall several years ago, there were uh, some horrific attacks in Nice, France, uh, all related now to the uh, revelations of the cartoons again, and arguably the way the French have mishandled this particular incident in how they're dealing with uh, the breakout of violence in France. And that comes on the heels of a, a, an attack just last week in Vienna that certainly got my attention, an ISIS sympathizer, uh, that was born in North Macedonia. He had emigrated into Austria. He was trying to get to ISIS. He ended up serving time in prison for his sympathies, got out of prison, and he uh, attacked several ind individuals in Vienna, killed them, was shot by the police. All of this has broken out recently, and it's alarming to not only officials in France, uh, and Austria, but elsewhere. We can dive a little deeper if you have questions on that because there have been a lot of recriminations of, uh, to the security forces for what they didn't do in light of the attack in Vienna in particular. So I wanna transition a little bit to hostage situation. There's been a lot of hostage stories of late. There was a repatriation of hostages that were freed in Yemen, three Americans, one, it was the repatriation of a body, two of them, uh, an individual by the name of Sam and another individual, I don't recall the name, were just released and traded out for a bunch of Houthis, which are fighters and people that have sought medical care in Oman. They were traded back into Yemen, the Houthis, for the three Americans. And this was facilitated by Saudi Arabia, by the state of Oman, and other Middle Eastern countries were involved with some of those negotiations. So it was a good news story. It's hopeful also that Saudi Arabia can broker some kind of deal with, with uh, the Houthis to end a horrific civil war that has tremendous humanitarian con consequences on the ground. Also another hostage talk, we've talked about American hostage, Austin Tice, who's been held by the Syrian government for eight years. It was reported recently in the Wall Street Journal that an American official had direct contact with the Syrian government. It's important to note that the Syrian government has denied holding Austin Tice, but uh, conventional wisdom is they have been holding him, they have not acknowledged it, and the United States government has treated Syria as if they're holding an American hostage and they have to be pressured uh, to, to release that hostage. So that was some good news. I don't know what, what has happened as a result of that. And lastly, on a hostage front, uh, hostage, uh, front some excellent news as it relates to a hostage rescue, rescue that took place in northern Nigeria. It might have got lost in the news cycle, but a couple weekends ago, SEALs executed a dramatic recovery of an American missionary who had just been taken hostage in Niger, moved to the ungoverned space of Northern Nigeria. He was rescued by Navy SEALs, as I said, and repatriated back to the United States. Now I should note, uh, I spent some time with my team trying to bring, bring back another American by the name of Jeff Woodkey, who's a missionary who's been held by terrorists in Niger going on four years. We hope that eventually we can bring uh, Jeff Woodkey home and return him to his family. Uh, last and certainly not least, I'm really paying close attention to the possibility that US forces will pull be pulled out of uh, Somalia, some 700 US forces 
be before the inauguration and also watching closely what happens on the ground in Afghanistan. There's some confusion according to reporting that I've read in the New York Times, uh, and there's certainly lots of discussion during a transition of the timetable and the situation on the ground, because it seems that the peace and reconciliation has broken down the talks in Qatar. So I am hoping and remaining hopeful that uh, we make some progress, progress on that front. So I wanna transition for a moment to my remarks on Ali Safan's book. And uh, just as a lead in, Ali Safan's book has been reissued with many of the redactions restored. His book is really important because it provides a really clear picture of 9-11, of not just post 9-11, his dealings during 9-11 and his investigative work, but it's really the journey of an investigator before, during, and after. And I think it's really an important narrative. It's personalized, but at the same time, it is very much focused on his journey, his lessons learned. And now with those redactions restored, it gives us a far more complete picture. And I think it's a very, very important narrative. And some of the things I'm gonna ask Ollie to talk about is him sharing some of his lessons learned on those experiences to include with interviewing many Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda related uh, detainees. Uh, he very successfully executed non-coercive interviews of those, uh, those detainees. And I think it's an important story. And uh, he will share maybe the nuance of cooperation versus compliance and talk about those experiences. And one would be mistaken if they thought this was just about the discussion on interrogation. As I said, it's really a broader view of our work before 9-11, through 9-11, through the years after. And it's phenomenal work by somebody that dedicated his life to, uh, to really countering uh, uh, radical Islamists and investigating radical Islamist terrorists. So um, let me go ahead and turn it over to Ali. And uh, I think uh, we welcome lots of questions. And the last point I would make is maybe Ali could frame his, his remarks on what's happening currently and what he thinks of the future threat, given that we're coming up on, we're in the 20th anniversary year since 9-11. What does all this portend? Ali, my friend, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Chris. It's a great honor to be with you and uh, to have this discussion with you. And it's just uh, listening to you talking about all these issues, uh, you know, from uh, the, the threats and the terrorist attacks that we've seen in Europe and, and uh, also what's happening against our, uh, you know, diplomats, the hostile actions that they are encountering in places like Cuba and places like China and places like Russia, uh, frankly, from around the world, just gives you an idea about how important it is to focus on the threat matrix that we still face as a country, uh, even though most of the focus of the media is about what's happening uh, domestically. Um, so uh, I think more and more we need to um, have a, a better understanding of uh, what's happening in the world. Um, this, uh, you know, great power competition that we're seeing, uh, you know, what the Chinese and the Russians are up to uh, on a regional basis, also what the Turks and the Iranians are up to, um, how these vacuums that exist in so many different places around the world, in Syria and Libya and in Somalia, you mentioned in Afghanistan, in many areas, are helping groups like Al-Qaeda and groups like ISIS to regroup again and to build a, a wider networks. A lot of things happening in the world. Uh, and uh, I think, unfortunately, we, at least the media and the, the, the general public are not paying attention to all these things. Um, to go to, to, to the book, and I think we can discuss a lot of these issues um, uh, as we speak. You know, uh, the reason I wrote the book is because I wanted to basically consider consider it as an after action report of what i encountered during my my time uh, serving 
uh, in the government. 9-11 uh, is an event that changed the world. And, uh, you know, and, and I felt that my first-hand account uh, of the war on terror uh, before, during, and after 9-11 uh, would add something of value uh, to an important conversation. Um, again, as you mentioned, torture uh, was just one aspect, uh, one little aspect of this conversation. Uh, I had the honor uh, to serve uh, this nation at the front lines uh, from early on. So I saw the threat evolves over the years, uh, from Bin Laden issuing uh, statements and declaring war on the United States in August of 1996, and declaring fatwas in, Feb in February of 1998 and March of 1998, and doing uh, a threat through ABC News at the time to, uh, to, to the US, to the East African Embassy bombing, to the USS call, to 9-11. So this book tells the story of America's successes and America's failures uh, in the war against Al-Qaeda, from the origins of the organization right through the death of Osama bin Laden on May 2nd, 2001. Um, you know, I think the aim of it is to articulate the facts. So hopefully we can learn from both uh, our successes and our failures. So yeah, I mean, I think it will be a really good idea uh, to, uh, to, to read uh, this uh, humble after action report. So one of the other comments I wanna make, it's really important to share a quote from Ali's book, which I think is extraordinary and really underscores why he wrote the book. And again, I'm speaking for him in some ways, but the lesson of the release is if you fight for the truth hard enough, eventually you will win. So I can't underscore enough, a book where there were significant redactions after nine years, fighting through a process, a process that we're responsible for. And now you have the opportunity, there's some vind, you know, vindication. You did eventually win because now the full story can be told. Yeah, so that's absolutely. When the first, uh, when the book came out, uh, you know, the FBI basically said that there's nothing classified in it. Unfortunately, um, you know, the situation wasn't the same with the agency. And a lot of things have been redacted. Um, you know, uh, even pronouns have been redacted in many sections of the book. Anything that shows that uh, EITs did not work, anything that shows that people cooperated without EITs, anything that shows that CIA officers or whoever was were there, were doing really good interviews and generating good intelligence without EITs, without waterboarding, that was declassified, that was classified. And now, and thanks to the institutional transparency that we've seen from the CIA leadership uh, today, a lot of these things have been, actually all of them have been unredacted and people can read exactly what happened, how we get the information regarding, for example, the dirty bomb or regarding uh, the tower, um, the, the, the LA attacks or regarding regarding the disruption of the network in Southeast Asia. A lot of the things that we heard over the years, how we got it specifically from EITs. And, you know, in, in a way, um, even though I didn't feel like this at the time, I'm, I'm kind of grateful uh, that the redaction took place because uh, they redacted the book on national security grounds. And you don't redact lies uh, on national security grounds. You don't redact uh, the experience and the narrative of an American official who was there, his first-hand account on national security ground if it wasn't the truth. So now at least uh, people who were confused or who were misled or who uh, or misinformed I can read these things and know exactly what happened and how we get all this information. And that is a great, um, you know, uh, uh, tribute um, to all the people who did it the right way, to all the people who stood up against any of the techniques that uh, are not are non-Americans. And we can discuss what, you know, I'm sure this is going to come, uh, come in the questions and answers. And that shows that in America, with everything that, you know, with all the pessimism that we see in the media, with all the pessimism that we hear about every day, that in America, if you fight for the truth long enough, if you fight hard enough, and you, if you fight smart enough, um, you know, the truth uh, will be out. And I think uh, this is uh, one of the things that make uh, this nation truly great. Um, you asked me before a question about the lessons from the book, and I think um, I think the main lesson that you will see in the Black Banner is uh, the difference, the difference between acting out of fear and acting out of knowledge. 
uh, and I think that is that is extremely important. And this is a true in anything, from deciding how to interrogate a suspect, uh, whether to torture them or to outwit them, uh, to get information, uh, how to deal with rogue states. Um, do we simply resort to force, or do we first try to understand, uh, you know, the network to use the amazing intelligence that we have from our intelligence agencies to go through this process of. Uh, of what's going on in, in this organization, the internal divisions that they might have, the hostilities against you know, individuals inside the groups. How can we try to manipulate all these things to our advantage? And you will see in the book how we did it again and again and again, and we were successful not only in generating intelligence that saved lives, but also in, in, in dismantling the network. And, uh, and, and, and as uh, I think General McChrystal said, it will take a network to defeat the network. Um, our greatest success against Al-Qaeda came when we did exactly that, when we understood how they recruit, when they understood how they brainwash, when they understood how they operate and how they move their operatives around. When we use that knowledge to, outwit, uh, to, to outwit uh, the individuals that we're, we're, uh, we're, we're interrogating or to at least be a step ahead um, of them. And um, and I think this is this is this is our greatest uh, successes. This is where it came from, and our failures have came um, have have come when um, we instead let ourselves be guided either by ignorance or by partisan politics or by fear or by brutality. And these failures explain why approximately 400 terrorists on the eve of 9/11, 400 terrorists who pledged bayah to Osama bin Laden and became pledged members of Al-Qaeda on the eve of 9-11, became a movement of more than 45,000 terrorists today, and they have been uh, you know, uh, in a war against the greatest power on earth longer uh, than the combined duration of the First and Second World War. To, uh, Second war. So uh, this is something that we have to keep in mind, and this is one of the reasons that I, I wrote the book, I wrote the Black Banners, and this is the reason I actually wrote also Anatomy of Terror, to explain how the threat is evolving. Look, the kind of network that attacked us on 9-11, um, the, the, the command and control that they have, this does not exist anymore. Um, you know, we, Bin Laden is dead. Many of the leaders of Al-Qaeda are either dead or, or having their retirement plan in Guantanamo Bay. But I think what happened is that the, Al-Qaeda mutated over the years and they continue to mutate until today. Uh, Al-Qaeda went from being, uh, you know, a group of guys with Osama bin Laden uh, early on, uh, you know, um, in Afghanistan after the Battle of Jalalabad, uh, you know, uh, bin Laden was heavily defeated. A lot of people thought that bin Laden is over. Uh, nothing is gonna, you know, this guy, this Saudi Arabian adventurer um, is done. And then he went to Saudi Arabia and from there he ended up in Sudan. And after he was kicked out of Sudan, uh, a lot of people thought Al-Qaeda is, 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 uh, is, is over. In Sudan he was planning to establish an Islamic army, fund groups that goes to fight in Chechnya or in Bosnia, help uh, the rebellion in, uh, in, um, in Somalia and so forth, plan to kind of like connect a lot of these people who are in Afghanistan together to establish a network. But after he was kicked out of Sudan and went back to Afghanistan, many people thought, you know, this adventure is over. And again, what happened is bin Laden established an alliance with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda network and mutated into another form. It became an organization with a strong command and control structure. It became an organization uh, that only worked with people who pledge allegiance to, to them. And they did the East Africa embassy bombings. They did the USS Cole, and they were successful in, on 9-11. And after 9-11, suddenly the sleeping giant, <laughs> you know, the United States, people woke up, even though a lot of uh, friends in um, the CIA and in, in the FBI were monitoring this and were telling people, pay attention to this guy, Osama bin Laden. But unfortunately, um, you know, people were not paying attention even after the USS call, even after the East African embassy bombings. 9-11 woke America up and we swiftly responded. Uh, bin Laden's organization was destroyed. Uh, the, the regime of the Taliban crumbled. But again, um, they 
mutated their, to another form. They became less an organization and more a message. And, uh, and Osama bin Laden continued from his hideout in, uh, in, in Abbottabad to, to kind of like, in a way, run um, a, a global network, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghrib, uh, Shabab, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. We know now from the documents that was recovered from his house um, how he was in contact with his commanders over there. The Arab Spring came, it changed the whole dynamics of Al-Qaeda. And bin Laden basically now, instead of focusing on the United States and on the West, he asked his followers to focus on local causes. Bin Laden before forbade his followers to focus on local causes. He used to tell them, you're cutting a tree. And this tree is a huge trunk. Let's say it's a, it's a hundred centimeter trunk. And you're in the middle of it. And then you had an opportunity to cut a branch. Let's call this a branch Saudi Arabia or Bahrain or whatever, or Qatar or France or England. Do you stop your efforts and cut that branch or do you continue to cut the trunk of the tree? That was um, his message to his commanders every time they asked him questions about targeting entities that's not the United States and it's not the West. Now, after 9-11, after he was, uh, sorry, after uh, the Arab Spring, after he started seeing regimes crumpled in, in Yemen, in, in, in Libya, and um, in, in Egypt, he actually asked his commanders that, look, we have been successful in, uh, you know, in, in, in hitting the United States and making the United States fearful to support its dictators. So phase one of our war is over. Now we have to go to phase two. So what's phase one? Al-Qaeda has a strategy called the management of savagery. Phase one is to do terrorist attacks in order to um, um, weaken the international order. Um, when the international order and the regional order weaken, states will fall. When states will fall, somebody has to fill the vacuum. Phase two is where Al-Qaeda comes to fill the vacuum by creating alliances with other groups in these countries and preventing anyone else from filling the vacuum. Because as Bin Laden said, his word, not mine, whoever fills that vacuum is going to be the new agent uh, for the Americans. Phase three is to declare a state. And then when you do states in places like Yemen, places like Asahel with AQIM, in places like Syria, and you connect them together, you have the caliphate with phase three. So this is Bin Laden's strategy. He took the Arab Spring as an example that phase one has been successful and Al-Qaeda needs to go on phase two. And that was the last order he gave before the Navy SEALs bullets took him down. Bin Laden's commander, for example, in Yemen, a guy by Abu Basir. Chris, you and I, we know Abu Basir very well. We worked Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, you know, Abu Basir uh, was, used to be the chief of staff of Osama bin Laden when he was in Afghanistan before 9-11. And uh, later he uh, ended up in Yemen and he was commanding Al-Qaeda and the Islamic, uh, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. Abu Basir asked bin Laden, he wrote him a letter and he said, Sheikh, do you want me to take Sana'a? Because if you want Sana'a, I can deliver it today. And bin Laden responded, he said, I want Sana'a, but I want us to be, I, I want us to be able to keep Sana'a. So no, um, and that is the plan that Al-Qaeda is doing now. And we see it in Syria, we see it in Libya, we see it in a, a AQIM, we see it in Somalia. And it's successful in a way, in, in some places, and it's not successful in other places. But we need to understand the threat as it is today, not as it used to be five or six years from, uh, you know, ago or 10 years ago. And this threat is evolving. The same thing with ISIS. Yes, we were able to destroy, crush the so-called caliphate, kill that fake caliph, murderer, rapist, jackass, uh, Baghdadi. But guess what? What's going to happen with ISIS now is Al ISIS is going through exactly what Al-Qaeda went through after 9-11. They are regrouping. They have a provinces. These provinces are active. We need to be very careful in preventing uh, ISIS to mutate into another form like Al-Qaeda has mutated over the years. So um, I think our intelligence community, our law enforcement community, they are doing a phenomenal job in keeping us safe. 
But I think uh, what we've seen in France and what we've seen in Vienna is a reminder that the threat is not is, is, is still there. And what's happening today in places like Sahel and places like Somalia and places like Idlib in Syria and places like Afghanistan and some areas in Pakistan, um, in places like Mozambique, uh, you know, and in Nigeria, um, this is just a warning of uh, of um, of what might come if we don't focus on these issues and prevent and counter terrorism according to. Uh, according to how the threat is evolving today. Okay, we have so many questions and they are in different pockets. So I will try to gather them around sort of themes. This is an excellent place to start though. Um, what do you worry most about where the security of the US homeland is concerned? You know, how do you characterize foreign extremist potential to attack the U.S. versus homegrown terrorism from within the United States? Look, the, the, the jihadi, that's a very good question. And the jihadi terrorism is definitely still there. Uh, we should not forget about that. However, um, I think we have a protocols and procedures. We have uh, we have uh, our own, you know, JTTFs, um, uh, the Joint Terrorism Task Forces around the nation. We have an amazing cooperation between our intelligence services and between our law enforcement services in focusing on this threat. And that's why we have been able to prevent the U.S. by saying we. The U.S. have been able to prevent another 9-11 from happening or, or another big terrorist attacks, you know, from happening. And even with the lone wolf terrorists, I think we have been able to, to, to intercept them before they do the operation, even though sometimes they go from the radicalization phase to the operation phase in a very short period of time. So I think we have the laws, we have the rules, we have the regulations, we have the, um, the, the, the guidelines, and we have the cooperation to deal with the jihadi threat. The things that really scares me about the domestic threat is, uh, the rise of neo-Nazi groups and white supremacist organization and these uh, so-called militias. Again, they are not militias in any way, shape, or form. They are not the militias that the Second Amendment protect and talked about, militias under civilian leadership under the states. Uh, those groups are, you know, to the most part, neo-Nazi organizations, a group like Adam Waffen, a group like the base, who basically, they named themselves after Al-Qaeda and they use Al-Qaeda manuals, by the way, um, a lot of these organizations have connections with Russia. A lot of them go overseas for training, for um, building global network, uh, like the jihadis did in the 90s and the 2000s when they went to Afghanistan. Um, you know, those guys go to Ukraine uh, to fight and coordinate in, in the Ukraine. I think during the, I think um, the, the, the in, in the national security strategy, President Trump's national security strategy, they mentioned the threat of uh, neo-Nazi anti-Semitic groups, um, and they mentioned few groups, uh, frankly, as, as a threat to the national security of the United States. The FBI, the DHS, uh, put them as a number one domestic threat um, in the United States. And unfortunately, we don't have these laws and these protocols and these guidelines that I spoke about that have been successful in targeting the jihadis, foreign terrorist groups. We don't have them domestically. We don't even have legislation for domestic terrorism in the United States. So even somebody like McVeigh, when he blow up, blew up a, a federal building, um, he can only be prosecuted with murder and um, you know weapons of mass destruction. Um, you know, there is no terrorism charges. And when you don't have terrorism charges on these groups, you cannot build, you cannot build a case with, um, with material support, a charge that is extremely important in, in disrupting terrorist plots. Basically, you're waiting for a body in order to, 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 do, to, to start a case. Uh, after 9-11, these rules changed when it comes to international terrorism. Unfortunately, we are still way behind the eight ball when it, come, uh, when it comes to domestic terrorism. So my number one threat 
um, that I will, you know, I'm really concerned about. And we did a lot of research and we put a lot of things in the Safan Center about the threat of white supremacy and all these different groups and how they are copying the jihadis in so many different ways and how they are establishing uh, an international network in Western countries. Um, it's uh, the rise of so-called, for the lack of a better term, I call them white supremacists. So if I could just add, everything Ali says is absolutely spot on. I would articulate and take, take you back four years. Four years this month, I was on the presidential transition team getting ready to be the special assistant to the president for counterterrorism. We rehearsed through, I created a scenario and talked the National Security Council staff through a potential scenario that I thought would potentially take place with no intelligence, just understanding the environment that Ali just laid out. And I wrote a scenario about someone driving a vehicle down a bicycle path and killing people uh, and uh, self-identifying as a jihadist, yelling Allah Akbar, then surrendering to authorities. Uh, in, in essence, a lone wolf attack by somebody that self, self radicalizes. Now, I couldn't have known that that would have played out almost to the scenario I created because it took place sadly on, on Halloween that same year in 2017. It took place in New York City. A guy by the name of Saipoth got in a vehicle, drove people, uh, drove down people tragically on Halloween Eve. Uh, a terrible case. If I was to create a scenario today, just to kind of fill in some of the blanks, I would create a scenario very much like that, but I would also add somebody from the far right also mobilizing for violence because there is, there is almost a, it's almost like virus has Virus is jumping into another host now because you have far right extremists going to some of the same websites, but they're radicalizing because they're angry about what? About the government. So they want to react and they're going to mobilize for lone wolf violence. It's happened since the pandemic uh, broke out. In fact, there was a individual in Missouri that was in a shootout with the FBI. He self radicalized. He was going to go attack a hospital because he did not fundamentally like the way the government was approaching COVID. So these are going to continue to occur. The environment is not less complicated. It is extremely more complicated. So we have what we've learned, what Ali has educated us on, Al-Qaeda, the birth of ISIS, but we also have this other dynamic that's never gone away, the far right. And I should mention also activists on the far left that may mobilize for violence. So across the spectrum, the, the U.S. government has to be prepared for all sides of the uh, ideological spectrum. And I think the FBI is well equipped. But if I would argue the single most important thing that needs to be done is we have to have a terrorist prevention architecture so we can start focusing on counter-radicalization on all sides of the spectrum. Thank you. Um, we certainly have some questions about enhanced interrogation. So I will now start that section um, of our program. Um, so are either of you aware of coercive interrogation techniques that have been successful in quickly obtaining actionable intelligence? Um, frankly, I'm not. I'm not aware. Uh, and I was uh, initially in, in, in the rooms and I was there when a lot of the examples that has been given in public about the successes of these techniques, um, they were actually, a lot of them happened before even waterboarding started. Uh, like for example, let's go and talk about the dirty bomb. This is the one that everybody talks about. Like why, why should we have uh, enhanced interrogation techniques. So hey, you know what? Even even in the, with the, with the OLC memos, they actually said you know there is basically waterboarding and whatever disrupted uh, an, uh, a terrorist attack, a dirty bomb in the Washington D.C. area. Well, waterboarding did not start until August first. Actually, frankly, July twenty fifth. Um, you know, um, two thousand. 
and uh, two. Um, Padilla, the alleged duty bomber, was in custody in May of 2002. So how can waterboarding led to the arrest of Padilla if Padilla was already in custody? Enhanced interrogation techniques were not approved by Judge Bybee until August 1st of 2002. But when you look at some of the efficacy stuff that was given, even to the lawyers who drafted the OLC memo, and I'll talk about it in a lot of details in the book, you will see that Padilla was arrested not in May of, two, not in May of 2002. They changed it to May of 2003. And I remember when I was talking to senators about this, and they brought it up. I actually asked the senator, I said, how do your staff Google when Padilla was arrested? And they found that Padilla was arrested in May of 2002. So now you will know exactly how, how information was, was generated. And don't take my word for it. Look at the CIA's own inspector general in 2003. What did they say? The CIA interrogation program, detainee program, worked. It's very successful. And I agree. I make the argument that everything I talk about, the successes that we did, was actually part of the CIA interrogation program. I was detailed to the CIA when we were doing that, right? It was CIA officers and FBI agents working hand in hand before contractors came over, right? So yeah, as Chris can tell you, when you're doing interrogations, you have intelligence on these individuals. You just don't get that guy and make him a high value target without knowing anything about them, right? They didn't come out of thin air. We have intelligence about them. We have pocket litters. We have their hard drives. We have their computers. We have their calls. We have so many different things. Like with Abu Zubaydah, when, when I first saw him, I said, uh, I said, what's your name? And he, why? The very first thing he said to me, he said, his name is Dawood, right? And I said, what if I call you Hani? It scared the heck out of him because Hani was a name that his mother used to call him as a child. So we, we knew him on that level. And I said, so, um, Hani, what happened? What kind of mistake did you do that led us to you? I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, what about the, the plot that you were working on? Total bluff. And he gave me a plot. He's like, oh, that guy. And, you know, and I cannot, still, I cannot say. And, and actually, I, on this one, I kind of like censored myself when I first wrote the book about the location of that place and, 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 and that specific plot. So we wrote it immediately and we send it. So when he became septic hours later, um, the, the order came from that Washington that death is not an option because he was giving actionable intelligence and he continued to give actionable intelligence. The way we identified Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, we showed him the wrong photo. He was telling us about one Qaeda leader who's Abu Muhammad al-Masri. You know, there is information that he was killed recently. Um, the guy who masterminded the, 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 the East Africa embassy bombings, one of the top leaders of Al-Qaeda, and he was telling me in the hospital that, you know, Abu Muhammad was doing a plot against, again, a place that's still classified uh, that has directly impacted the U.S. national security. So I told my colleague, um, we just want to be sure that we're talking about, because, you know, with, as you see from the book, everyone have like 10 different aliases with these guys. So we just want to be sure that we're talking about the same guy. So Steve, my, my colleague, um, downloaded the poster of the um, 22 most wanted terrorists that we put after 9-11. And that included everyone, included all the people who we want for the East Africa embassy bombings, for the USS Coal, for the Kubar Tower. It has Shia, Sunnis, Bujinka plot, you know, with KSM, all the Islamic extremists, terrorists who are wanted. We put them all in one poster. That is the only photo book that we had at the time with us at the hospital, that poster. So Steve had this, uh, you know, I don't remember, you, you remember the Palm Pilot? You know, it's just like the Sony Palm Pilot and it has a stylus, right? Wait, now, so, you're, now you're like a museum person. You're telling us about artifacts from ancient history. Yeah, tell me about it. A lot of people like, you know, my, my kids, they see a phone, a regular phone. They say, what is this? <laughs> so um, so he, he clicked on it with his stylist, the photo of Abu Muhammad al-Masri. Steve was one of the case agents on the East Africa embassy bombing. He knew exactly who Muhammad al-Masri is. But because of 
the technology at the time, he actually clicked on the wrong photo. So when he gave it to me, I didn't look. I showed it to Abu Zubaydah. I said, who is this? Is this the guy that you're talking about? And he said, oh, no, no, this is not him. And I was really upset. I was, I was like, dude, you, you're lying about, you tell us about a plot and you're lying about this guy. You think we don't know who he is? So I said, who is, who is this? And he said, come on, don't play with me. You know who this is. This is, this is Mukhtar. This is a guy who did the plane operations. And I looked at it and it was Khalid Sheikh Muhammad. At the time, we had no idea that Khalid Sheikh Muhammad was in Al Qaeda. So, and you will see story by story with, with PDA. You'll see how we went. We had three calls that was approved by the DCI at the time to have, believe it or not, even if we have incriminating evidence, sometimes we cannot share it with the guy because it's a classified and he doesn't have the clearances, even if it's him on the phone. But so we were able to declassify three tech cuts to, to share it with him. But then we realized that, you know, what the heck can you do with the three tech cuts? I mean, this is, so we went and we bought a couple of dozen of empty audio tapes and um, we marked them, you know, the, all the CIA guys over there were <laughs> saying marking tapes, put it on a cart, went in. One of the tapes, one of the, the, the calls, he refused, he, he forgot to shut down his phone. So when I was interviewing him, because everything was in Arabic with the calls, when I was interviewing him, I acted as if I made a mistake. And I was just like, oh my God, you know, trying to stop the audio tape. I just want to plant in his head that it's not only a phone, it's also a bug in his house. That's why you, he still can hear what's going on. And this is when he started telling us about all the conversations that he was having to include the conversation with Pidia later on uh, about the dirty bomb. So now people can see exactly what happened. So to go back to the CIA's inspector general, he said, even though the CIA program has been successful, but there is no evidence that enhanced interrogation technique resulted in the disruption of any imminent plots. That is in the CIA Inspector General. The CC report, they came also to the same conclusion. Uh, the CIA Inspector General said it's very difficult to determine, and but there is no evidence it directly, you know, it, it directly stopped any, any, any plots. So yeah, if you look at the people who reviewed these programs, if you look at all the different memos now that they have been released, you will see that, I don't know, you know, like I, I, can, I, I can only speak of the stuff that I was there, but there's some stuff that has been talked about, like for example, the uh, plot in Heathrow with KSM, right? It was supposedly because of EITs, but there is a CIA memo that has been declassified a few years ago. And it basically said, that immediately after his arrest, he gave information, he gave information regarding the Heathrow plot because, and this is a CIA member, because he thought that Ramzi bin Sheeb already gave the information up. So that is how it happens in real world. In the real world, I mean, the narrative, the official narrative about EITs, it's taken like from a movie, from a Hollywood movie. You get a guy, you beat him up, he talks, right? If torture works, Egypt will be the safest place on earth. If torture works, Pakistan and pa Afghanistan will be the safest places on earth. <laughs> right? Um, did, um, sorry, Chris, did I interrupt you? No, no, I think for the sake of time, let's take some more questions. So go ahead, Amanda, that yeah, was great. Um, there's a question about whether um, the use of enhanced interrogation affected whether any of our intelligence partners wanted to work with, with the U.S. Sure. I mean, it definitely have a significant uh, uh, impact on the relationship, especially with our European partners. Uh, there is information that we have on people in Europe that we cannot share with the Europeans uh, because they won't accept it in our their courts. And people are afraid walking in the streets because the information was produced in ways that the, the British thinks it's illegal or, or whatever, European country. But England is one of them. Um, also, it impacted us. Um, you know, we have one of the worst uh, mass murderers in the 21st century, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who admitted 
killing 3,000 Americans, and we cannot even prosecute him. He has been sitting fat and happy in Guantanamo Bay, right? So when you do something, when, when our tactics contradict, and our, our tactics, because I don't believe we had a strategy, when our tactics uh, does not go hand in hand with our values, legal values, national values, um, towards the end, um, we're gonna have, it's gonna, we're gonna hit a wall. And, and that's, that's why a lot of these people who have blood on their hands still cannot be prosecuted, still cannot uh, receive the justice that their victims deserve. I don't care what they deserve. Um, and, 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 and this is because of, frankly, this. That's it. And let me just add that at a macro level, working policy, that was the culmination of my career. I did a lot of engagement with our foreign partners. First, we couldn't be successful without our engagement with foreign partners. And Ali knows that as well as anyone. Um, but that said, working the policy angles, every one of those foreign partners expressed concern to me on Guantanamo Bay in some of the issues Ali Safan is talking about. And that was many years after, you know, his, his his book was written, right? Eight or nine years after, I still had foreign partners expressing uh, serious concerns with Guantanamo Bay, serious concerns with what we were gonna do with ISIS. And of course, the United States recently, to be fair, has brought ISIS fighters back to the United States and is prosecuting them to the full extent of the law. So I think there have been lessons learned. This is not all gloom and doom because the United States and our foreign partners, we have learned a lot since 9-11. And it's been, it's been a difficult path. That's why I really enjoy uh, Ali Safan's book because Ali really has the personal narrative as I said, and I don't want to put too fine of a, a point on it, but it is important to see the personal side of this and the leadership aspect of it. So what other questions do we have, Amanda? Do we still have time? We still have a little bit of time, and you queued that up beautifully, Chris, by returning to the book, because we've got a few that I'm going to try to combine, um, which result in, you know, what is the balance between the public's need to know and what the government needs to keep classified how do you feel about redactions when meanwhile, you know, the person who worked uh, a case can't mention anything, but here are all the media reports that have name names and locations. And how, how do you balance all that? Uh, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a very good question. I think, you know, the balance, look, if something in, is in the New York Times, right? right. Let's say, and it happened when I was writing the book, frankly. Um, I will be talking about a case that I was involved in, and then I'll try to see what's what's public about it, right? So, you know, I see an article in the Washington Post, or Wall Street Journal, or the New York Times, some details, right? Some of the details are accurate, some are not. Um, I am, just because they are on the first page of the New York Times, does not make it unclassified. So I want to continue to basically write and articulate my, my narrative within what has been approved by the US government. Now, if there is something, because you know what, it might be a leak, that leak might be under an investigation, it might hurt sources and methods when it came out, so we have to keep that in mind. Now, when the US government put a report, when the CIA or the FBI or DOD or the White House declassify something, when the 9-11 Commission writes, you know, writes an incident in their own report, right, then it's declassified. You can't just tell one, and that happened with me in the declassification fight with, uh, initially with, uh, with, uh, with the government, is because, you know, I take it and say, it's in the 9-11 Commission. They say, well, just because it's a 9-11 commission, we disagreed that it should be in the 9-11 commission, so you shouldn't be talking about it. You know, these kind of things, this is, this is a problem. And, 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 and this is a problem with, with that balance. Because these rules are there for a reason. 
Okay, they are there to protect the national security of the United States, to protect sources and methods. Transparency can be done. Transparency can be done in a way um, that protect sources and methods and protect the national security interests of the United States. I don't think the two contradict each other. But then when you start using classification for disinformation campaign, when you start using classification in order to protect yourself as an individual, not as a nation, of something that has been done, this is actually in the law, it's against the law. And this is when we don't have transparency, and this is when we don't have accountability. Because the accountability cannot be achieved either because it became heavily partisan, hyper-partisan, or because it's heavily classified. And this, what will allow conspiracy theories to grow. This create a fertile ground for disinformation, for conspiracies, for the truthers, for whatever you want to call it. It comes from that. So what we see today, you know, and a lot of people, you know, blame, oh, it's the Trump administration. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not giving the Trump administration, a, you know, a, a pass on this. But a lot of these things, you know, it's, you know, this fact-free culture that we live in today um, basically has merely been taken to its logical conclusion. You know, the truth has been swamped for a long time by conspiracy theories, by raw emotions, by partisan talking points. We, ha we live in a world of alternative facts. It didn't happen three years ago or four years ago. Opinions now enjoy the same status as a reality. Does Saddam have what WMD? Oh, yes. Where is the fact? Well, I believe he does, so he does, right? Um, so no wonder that our adversaries like the Russians and the Iranians and the Chinese find it easy to divide us with this information because we started that with ourselves. How many people held accountable for the Iraq war? How many people held accountable for the fact that Saddam was not working with bin Laden? 75% of the American public believed that Saddam Hussein was behind 9-11 before the war in Iraq started. How many people were held accountable for this lie? How many people was held accountable for going and invading a country and messing up the Middle East royally as we see it, bring back Al-Qaeda, eventually create ISIS because of some people who manufactured intelligence that did not exist? And not one single person was held accountable. So the war in Iraq, the intelligence regarding the war in Iraq, torture, everything became, became part of the political discourse, unfortunately. The poison is political discourse. And people try to make it, oh, it's FBI versus CIA, it's military versus CIA. No, it's not. It's not. I was there. It's not. It's not about the FBI. It's not about CIA. Some of the people who actually pushed me, I, I was a young kid during these things. Some of the people who used to take me and explain to me what's really happening <laughs> were CIA officers. And I mentioned, I mentioned them in the book, definitely don't mention their names, but I mention it in the book. And that's why I refused to prosecute any of the CIA officers who were there at the sites. Just because you were a CIA officer and you were there at the site, it does not mean in any way, shape or form that you agreed with what the contractors were doing. And that's why, you know, when I wrote my torture decision and I said we should not, I was attacked from the left for um, supporting the CIA who were involved in torture. And I was attacked by the right for disagreeing with torture. And guess what? They think they pissed me off. This is when I knew that I was doing the right thing, when both of them attack you. <laughs> so when everybody's mad at me, I'm on the right track? In this, in this day and age, yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 sorry, Chris. What was finish your thought, and I just I've got a closing comment. Yes, you make your closing comments, and then I'll wrap it all up. Well, that last question was tremendous. That was a softball for the International Spy Museum because I've been fond of saying that you know the single inoculation against protecting democracies it really is an educated populace, and our job is to educate educate the population on intelligence work and uh, and do so factually apolitically and just that very question 
that that individual asked, secrets kept, secrets revealed. We have a whole gallery dedicated to that. We have a whole gallery that talks about interrogation, not just enhanced interrogation, but interrogation through the lens of history, non-coercive methods that Ali is talking about. And uh, we challenge people to come to the museum, see for yourself. This has been extraordinary. I wish we could go a couple more hours. As a matter of fact, we have to move on to another event, Ali and I. So Ali, it was an honor and a privilege to have you. Uh, full disclosure, Ali's a friend of mine, but he's also well thought of in the community for his post-government work as well, what he does to support families of hostages in a whole range of other things that I, I won't I won't reveal here, but uh, Ali does tremendous work and we're all grateful. Thanks for joining us. I'll kick it back to Amanda for any closing comments. Great I question. Do wanna, yeah, Amanda. I, I do wanna apologize to the many, many people who wrote many fascinating questions. We obviously could not get to all of them. I will try to share this with Chris and Ali after the fact, just so they can see them. There were so many issues. They were so interesting. I thank Chris and Ali for being here. It was fascinating. I can't thank our wonderful sponsors, AT&T and Kerasoft enough for making programming like this available. I wanna give a little ad tonight at 5.30. We have a free program with a former Russian FSB um, officer, very interesting program with a real foreign spy, former foreign spy. Check our website for that and for other programs. And if you are feeling grateful or thankful in this season running up to Thanksgiving and you appreciate our programs, um, why not consider donating to our Mission Resilience Program? And if you donate now through the end of the year, your lovely contribution will be doubled. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ali. Thank, thank you, Chris. You. Everyone thank stay well. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.